Good morning and welcome to the BBA's webinar on top risks in 2016 in partnership with the Eurasia Group. My name is Philip Allen, Director of Learning at the BBA, and today for the next hour to discuss the top risks in 2016, I'm joined by presenters Simon Hills, BBA's Executive Director of Potential Regulation and Risk, and Sean West, Deputy CEO and Managing Director of Eurasia Group. Before Simon kicks us off, may I remind you that this is an interactive webinar in which you can engage by, one, asking questions throughout the presentation. Just click on the orange question tab below the screen and type out your question. We'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. However, if we don't have time to answer your question, the presenters have agreed to be on hand after the presentation to answer your questions. You will notice that there's also a resource tab below the screen of which Eurasia have uploaded their top 20, sorry, top risk reports for 2016. I suggest you have a good look at that and a good read of that, and that's accessible as well. This um, webinar will be available approximately two hours after the presentation, so if you do miss it or you want to circulate it to colleagues, you will have the ability to do that. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Phil. And uh, this webinar, I think, uh, differs from the ones we've uh, engaged with you on uh, in the past, which tend to be very detailed, looking at the sort of regulation that's uh, coming our way over the next uh, month, next three months, the next six months, trying to identify the impact of it on your businesses. Whereas I think, uh, Sean, you and your colleagues at uh, Eurasia are at a much uh, higher level. You see yourselves, I think, and I know you are, as facilitators. You help boards think out of the box uh, about risks that are not perhaps on the mechanistic risk register, uh, encouraging them to think, I believe, uh, how apparently unconnected um, risks can cluster and, and then as they contemplate how those unconnected risks can cluster to create a narrative around the probability and impact uh, of those uh, potential risks that come out of left field um, in order to have a view of what the impact on the firm's business model is. So I know you guys have uh, produced your uh, top risks for 2016, and you're going to take us through some of the, those. But I think uh, many of the people uh, joining us on the webinar will be looking to you to uh, do that left field thinking to the extent they're not doing it already and then to, to enable them as, as risk managers to uh, advise the board about uh, what those slightly esoteric risks might be. Wonderful. Uh, we, we delight in facilitating left field thinking. Uh, Eurasia Group, we view ourselves as the, the authority on geopolitical risk for boards, for executives, uh, for government affairs teams, for risk teams, and we're very pleased uh, not only to be a member of the BBA, but also now to uh, be presenting to you on our top risks for 2016. I'd invite all of you, uh, some of you are clients already, if you're not, uh, please feel free to get in touch to discuss how we can take uh, some of this big picture thinking down to the level of issues that you're currently thinking about, be it at the country risk level, be it connections uh, between different country risks, or be it at the global strategy level. You know, we're, when, when we step back uh, and look at the world that we're in today, one, one might be forgiven for just simply making the assertion that the world is getting riskier. It may well be getting riskier, and by the end of this presentation, I have a feeling that you'll believe it's getting riskier. Uh, but we, we need to think, uh, think pretty clearly about whether for our firms uh, the world is getting riskier or whether it's presenting opportunities, whether these risks are manageable or whether these are really threatening, and whether things that we don't believe are currently risky uh, for ourselves could uh, metastasize and become risky for us over a reasonable time horizon such that planning is required. Uh, so, so as a firm, we like to help, uh, like to help our clients step back, uh, understand what's on the horizon, do some early warning, some horizon scanning, and then connect it to their strategic planning. If you're going to enter a new market, a lot of banks are looking at, say, opening branches in the Middle East. Well, how does Middle East security uh, factor into that? And not just hard security, um, but more broadly, the geopolitical elements, as an example. Um, so I'll jump in here. We're going to present to you our top 10 risks. We've got a few red herrings at the end, things that may seem risky but aren't. Um, but what is, what is the criteria for calling something a top risk? Uh, how do we decide to put it on our list? And these are our global top risks across industries. So we're tailoring the risks for the financial sector today. I'll attach uh, each of these elements has implications for the financial sector. I'll make those clear. But these are the biggest uh, events with material probability 
So it doesn't mean they're likely, but it means they're likely enough that we need to worry about them that would have the broadest reach and biggest impact on the business environment or the financial markets. So some of these that we're going to discuss, and you've got the list in front of you today, uh, from the Hollow Alliance uh, through to unpredictable leaders down to uh, Turkey as a country risk, uh, some of these that we're, we're going to discuss are uh, are events that, that we're already seeing happening and we're wrestling with the way that they could play out and the different, the different potential outcomes. Our job is to forecast for you what we think they're going to play out. Uh, some of these are things we see on the horizon that we want to flag, um, but if they happened, would be fundamentally disruptive. So they rise to that level. And others are, frankly, traditional country risks. To put Brazil and Turkey on the list, they have very unique situations. The world is not, uh, not, not providing them with, uh, with comfortable external environments to deal with some of the, the traditional risks that we see from a corruption scandal in Brazil to a president who is trying to consolidate power in Turkey. Um, but they are, they are happening in an environment that means the ramifications are fundamentally risky. So let's jump into the first risk. The hollow, uh, the hollow alliance, uh, and as I said, I'll be connecting these uh, two implications for the financial sector as we move along. So the hollow alliance. Now, for anyone who's been operating in the transatlantic environment, uh, you'd be you'd be forgiven for thinking the alliance might already be hollow. There's not a uh, there's not been a ton of U.S. EU cooperation in say the last 12 or 24 months on issues that are materially important to the financial sector. Uh, when we think about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership and whether it's likely to get done, uh, what you see is a U.S. government uh, that's been much more keen to engage with Asia than to engage with Europe. But what we're describing here in the Hollow Alliance is actually much more fundamental than that, and that's why it's our number one risk. It's that for decades, the creation of a single phone number in Europe uh, and the belief uh, that the U.S. had that Europe was its most fundamental partner, either through NATO or through other, or, or through uh, through through constructed arrangements where the U.S. and EU would collaborate on taking positions in trade negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world or on financial regulation issues. Um, there was a fundamental bond between the U.S. and Europe um, that that underpinned the ability to get things done uh, for for the financial community uh, in international fora, but also also to respond to crises around the world. So when there was a fire uh, going somewhere in the world, you had a firefighter. Uh, you could look at various points in time, be it the Iraq War or others, where certainly the relations were tense, but fundamentally no one questioned the relevance of NATO and no one questioned the fact that the U.S. and the EU had fundamentally aligned incentives on a lot of these risks. Uh, we put forward a term in recent years, one of our top risks, I believe it was 2012, uh, was of a G0 world. So we're going to have the G20 meeting this weekend. Uh, we believe the world is in a G0 moment where there's not a group of 20 countries uh, driving the global agenda. There's nobody in charge. There are countries with a variety of power and a set of incentives, and some of them can get things done. Um, but there's not a coherent decision-making body. There's no G2 between the U.S. and China. Um, there's no, no G8 with respect to driving the global agenda or a G20 that will provide global governance. All of these, these bodies or arrangements are important, but fundamentally we're at a moment where there is no global leadership. So you have, you have Russia invading Ukraine, and what response do you get? You get the fact that the U.S. and the EU have fundamentally different interactions with Russia and different preferences when it comes to Ukraine, and as a result, simply putting together a sanctions regime and maintaining a sanctions regime is fundamentally problematic. You have a U.S. that looks at China as much as an opportunity, as a threat. You've got a U.K. that looks at China as an economic economic opportunity and is willing to set aside a lot of the fundamental uh, geopolitical considerations the UK could have with respect to China long term, but look at it as an in, e uh, economic actor. And frankly, the fraying in Europe uh, of a common position, which I'm going to get to in the second slide a, a bit more in depth, uh, makes it harder for the U.S. When the U.S. wants a single phone number to call, it has to call a lot of different phone numbers. It gets a lot of different answers, and some of those phone numbers don't even connect to each other. So you've got a situation where as new risks emerge, you no longer have that global firefighter, but you also don't have uh, a baseline expectation that U.S. and EU incentives would be fundamentally aligned should the U.S. and EU decide to address some of these issues. So when you, you think about uh, the evolution of safe harbor data rules into a privacy shield between the U.S. and EU, even, even 
trying to even trying to make that evolution comes through fits and spurts because the U.S. Uh, the U.S. incentives with respect uh, to surveillance are just fundamentally different than EU perspectives, and now that's playing out uh, in clear day. It's not it's not behind the scenes where we, you could always suspect it was different. Now it's clear it's different, uh, and the countries are willing to say that publicly. So how do you actually get an evolution uh, into a better regime? It introduces an element of risk that'll underlie a lot of the different the different items that I cover going forward. So moving from the hollow alliance, uh, taking it down a level, that's big macro, take it down a level to what we call the closed Europe, our, our number two risk. Now, I'm, I'm cognizant I'm an American about to tell you uh, my views on Europe, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you those views uh, with respect to Brexit as well. But as a firm, our analytical platform of 70 analysts uh, generally hail from the countries that they're analyzing, their former government officials or journalists covering those countries. They understand the politics in depth, and their only goal is, is to forecast accurately for you how we see these things play out, not to take a position or play up risk. We, we, we don't have a book, uh, so to speak. We're not trying to drive risk. We want to help you understand this. So as we talk about a closed Europe, we see something fundamentally occurring uh, in Europe, and it's structural. It's not something Something that uh, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You've got a refugee crisis that, that the, the resolution of which will just introduce additional risk throughout Europe. Uh, so you can have yeah, the German strategy of of, uh, of turning Turkey into uh, into a refugee holding camp. You can have what seems to be an evolved European preference to turn Greece into much of the same thing. Um, all of that will increase risk into the system if the uh, if if the stress between EU leadership or between Germany and Greece leads Greece to decide that being in the EU is an even worse deal than they used to, than they thought it was six months or 12 months ago, that reintroduces the possibility of a Grexit. When you think about uh, what's fundamentally going on in the UK, a decision about whether to leave the EU, you've always had questions about whether the UK should leave the EU. You can trace back strands of thinking 20 or 30 years, Euroscepticism is not a new idea. But the fact is it's happening in an environment where it's okay, uh, it's okay to be nationalist. It's okay to be protectionist. There is political air cover for saying we're looking out for our own country uh, in, a, in an environment where the, ex the external conditions are worsening and introducing risk in the system. So you're no longer having a debate uh, in the U.K. necessarily about immigration into the U.K. You're having a debate about a refugee crisis and whether the U.K. is safer or less safe by being part of Europe. That introduces some risk. And it's also manifesting itself. I can speak a little more about Brexit, but it's also manifesting itself in the domestic political environment environment of a few of these countries. In Poland, you've got a nationalist government. In Hungary, you've got a nationalist government. Now, they, that manifests itself uh, in Hungary with deeper economic ramifications than it does in Poland, but it doesn't mean that that's a positive evolution uh, for, um, for firms that simply want to get business done um, in some of these countries. Having more nationalist governments can make that more difficult. You've got a consolidation uh, or you've got an increase uh, in, in uh, political representation for nationalist parties. In Sweden, you've got, uh, you've got countries that would probably follow the UK out of the EU if the UK were to decide to leave, for instance, like in Slovakia. So you've got got a, a set of conditions in Europe that has created fundamental risk in a system that we all actually depend on being stable. Uh, as an example, I gave a client briefing with one of my colleagues uh, two days ago where we spent 45 minutes on Brexit and 45 minutes on the U.S. election. When we started Eurasia Group, political risk was an emerging market phenomenon. The idea that we're sitting here in 2016 doing full client briefings on the UK and the US, and that last year we had to launch Canadian political risk coverage, should drive home the fact that from a geopolitical perspective, nowhere is safe. Some places are, far, are getting far riskier than one would tolerate. That's no different um, when it comes to the UK. As a firm, we think there's a 35% or a 30% chance of Brexit um, with, with some thinking that there's upward, uh, upward pressure on that probability. Um, but the ramifications of that, from business and regulatory uncertainty in a two-year period of exit to the potential loss of passporting to the fact that Europe would probably give the U.K. a bad deal if the U.K. were to leave just to raise 
raise the uh, attractiveness of membership uh, in the EU, uh, to potentially reduce the appeal of London as a global financial hub. All of this provides uh, thought-provoking implications for the financial community, but it also produces serious ramifications for your customers. Um, with this, this manifestation of closed Europe, you see the fraying of the Schengen area. That's a potential tax on trade. Um, we've seen numbers as high as a 3% implicit tax on trade if Schengen were to go away. Um, so it's bad for your customers. Uh, and your customers' supply chains that, that include the UK as a core part of that or as a knowledge hub, they'll have to rethink that as well. So um, my goal is not to play up it, it, play up the risk of a Brexit or, or all of this with respect to Europe, but it's to flag the fact that there's a material probability. You know, To any risk manager, 35% is terrifying of anything that really matters. Um, so just because I'm not telling you it's 70% doesn't mean I don't think it matters. I think it matters fundamentally. And um, we'll be updating as we move closer uh, to, to the vote in June. So the third risk, the China footprint. Uh, you'll notice that our third, that, that a China hard landing is not our number one risk. It's certainly front of mind for a lot of political actors. Uh, and you'll notice that our number three risk with respect to China is not even, uh, not even about a hard landing. In fact, uh, at risk of a spoiler alert, we'll have a China hard landing as a red herring later. We just simply don't think it's a top risk for 2016. Uh, but what we are highlighting here is a bit more fundamental, which is that uh, China's footprint is expanding. Uh, we no longer can, can look at uh, the Chinese market in isolation. That may seem like a simplistic point. But now when uh, investors in the, the Shanghai casino uh, start to get cold feet about some of the investments, we see global markets, uh, we see global markets react. We can no longer um, look at isolated factors in China uh, and view it as a China-specific story. We're seeing global ramifications. But we're also seeing an evolution by China to become fundamentally more um, engaged in global governance issues, in geopolitical issues, and in making itself available um, as a potential broker in some areas we wouldn't, we wouldn't expect. So I'll give an example. Uh, in January, I was in the Gulf meeting with CEOs of Gulf entities. Fundamentally fascinating. At the same time, Xi Jinping was in Riyadh and was in Tehran offering his good offices uh, to broker, uh, broker a geopolitical resolution between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, do we believe that China is actually going to do that? No. But the idea, number one, that China wants to be perceived that way, number two, that they're willing to engage, and number three, that leaders will actually take those meetings and allow this sense that China could somehow facilitate Middle East peace underscores uh, not just the expanse of the China footprint, but also that hollow alliance where the, the, the quartet that used to deal with the Middle East or the U.S. as an honest broker. Uh, for some of the risks that we're facing globally, there may be a role for other actors. And the fact is other actors are starting to get engaged. Now, what I think is pretty important for the financial sector is that Chinese engagement uh, can lead to Chinese assertiveness in international financial regulatory bodies. So China is no longer saying, you know, we're just a teenager, wait until we're an adult before you look to us for a global role. They're saying not only are we at the table now, but we have our own interests. And their interests involve a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of factors that affect the financial community, everything from preferences on cybersecurity to nationalist preferences with respect to, to financial architecture, uh, with respect to who can produce uh, the, the actual backbone of, of the Internet and of uh, the financial sector globally. We're seeing, we're seeing China thrust itself uh, into view in ways that, that foreign governments need to respond to. Is it okay to have a Chinese technology company closely associated with the Chinese state, build your servers as a bank. Is that okay? Is that safe? Are you, are you fulfilling your duties to your clients uh, if you have Chinese technology as a fundamental part of, uh, part of your backbone? Frankly, is it any worse than having U.S. technology as a fundamental part of your backbone? It's creating questions that we need to answer, and the Chinese are becoming much more assertive about putting forward their national champions, Huawei offering um, to, build, to build the backbone of the Internet for the Netherlands, for instance, but also looking to make acquisitions in the U.S. of sensitive technologies, and the U.S. basically saying no. So you're going to see divergence between how governments want to interact 
um, and you're seeing them competing on cost too. It creates some interesting uh, interesting tensions that we'll have to think about. But certainly, I would expect um, in all international forums to see more assertive Chinese leadership, uh, and frankly, from a geopolitical perspective, uh, to see China willing to raise the tensions, especially where it sees weak governments. And if you tie back into risks number one and two, where the U.S. is fundamentally you know, we can talk about the U.S. in depth and questions, but where the U.S. is uh, going through quite an introspective election and Europe as a whole is going through an existential set of events, China has the ability to assert itself the same way Russia has been asserting itself geopolitically because they're able to form coherent policy. They're able to take decisive action. So moving forward, number four, uh, our number four risk, ISIS and friends. Now, I'm not going to use uh, the call today to talk to you specifically about the risk of a terrorist attack in a particular city or to underscore the fact that ISIS has lots of power and the ability to take our mind off of whatever it is we thought was most important and fundamentally uh, stop and think about the implications of a terrorist attack on our own critical infrastructure, on our customers, on our operating environment. I think all of that is well known. What we wanted to highlight uh, in making ISIS and Friends number four uh, is the fact that this group has substantial reach. Um, you know, we, we, all, we all ride the tube, we all go out to dinner, we all, um, we, we all uh, engage uh, in, our, in our home environment as if everything is secure. And frankly, in, in many countries, the government has the ability to provide surveillance and generally speaking, keep us all secure. But the fact is we don't just do business in our home environment. And so where the Paris attacks underscored the risk in our home environment that we have to spend some time thinking about it, we really do have to give some thought to assets that we have uh, in Countries where the financial sector has, has rushed in. Turkey, an emerging market darling for 20 years, is seeing an attack every three or four weeks. Um, Gulf countries seem stable until they don't. Uh, they seem like they can provide security until they can't. Certainly, uh, certainly uh, a, a lot of us have presence in Egypt. We need to think about the ability uh, to continue to operate and do business there. Um, but is there the risk of a terror attack in a major market? Is, you know, the, the, would, would a terror attack in Dubai or in Singapore or in kind of secondary, uh, secondary financial hubs make us rethink um, the fragility uh, or the ability of those governments to provide security? Could that provide more attractiveness? For London or New York, could that provide? Uh, could, could that lead us all to the conclusion, uh, in the absence of those, that actually those are better places? And the fact that we're seeing threats in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. and Europe as bigger targets uh, make us rethink uh, the way we position ourselves going forward. The fact is. When we think about ISIS and friends, this is a risk we have here for 2016. Um, but the global the global environment is uh, is a providing probably uh, the the most fertile ground for this to be a risk for the next five or ten years. You know, we get asked asked regularly, how do you resolve the ISIS risk? What has to ha what has to go right for ISIS to go away? Well, basically, a number of things that just there is no case for going right anytime soon. You probably need oil to double or triple in price so that some of these Sunni governments can provide social programs and alternatives and jobs for disaffected youth that will otherwise be attracted uh, to a message of extremism. You, need, uh, you probably need to not have Sunni-Shia rivalry uh, in the Middle East such that it forces people uh, in different governments to take sides. Um, and you, you, need, uh, you frankly need a more stable uh, geopolitical environment in the Middle East so that the U.S., Europe, uh, and Russia don't increase the size of the targets on their backs by being drawn into conflicts. Um, you know, I, I, we, we like to talk about political opportunity as much as political risk. We like to help our clients see the upside. We're not just about downside, but I don't really have uh, a good message for you about what the next year or two looks like with respect to this risk. It's just about being vigilant and about thinking um, about how some of the unthinkable could really disrupt your business. Just to drive home the point with respect to France. I was recently in Japan um, taking briefings with CEOs. One CEO of a large household name Japanese company said, is it safe for me to travel to Paris? This was a question they raised, right? I thought this was in December. I thought this was, you know, a crazy, a crazy question, right? Is it safe for me to travel to Paris? My wife doesn't want me to travel to Paris. Do you guys think I can go? This was a question they would have asked us um, about, about much more unstable countries a year or two prior. Well, fast forward two or three weeks, Japan Airlines cancels its direct flight between Tokyo and Paris because, frankly, that wasn't the only CEO asking that question. 
right? So we need to think a bit about effects that seem out of whack for us. Uh, will it disrupt our, our uh, transcontinental um, businesses? Um, Moving ahead to number five, so I previewed a little bit about Saudi Arabia. So we've been doing our top risks. Eurasia Group's been around for 20 years. We've been doing our global top risks for 20 years. Saudi Arabia has never been on the list. If you want to make a bet on stability, you bet on Saudi Arabia. Well, except for this year and probably going forward. You've got a rivalry uh, in the you've got a rivalry in the elite. Um, but he, b- between uh, Mohammed bin Salman, Deputy Crown Prince, and the Crown Prince, you've got uh, the potential for a bot. Uh, of power in Saudi now, we put out a 35% chance. That was a 5% chance a year ago. Um, so, you know, we didn't move immediately to that. Um, but we really are seeing fraying. When you travel to Saudi as an elite, um, you hear, or sorry, when you travel to Saudi and speak to elites in Saudi, you hear them talk about the potential for leadership uh, disruption or, or botch transition you, as a foreigner would never have that conversation two or three years ago. Now that's an okay conversation for Saudis to have with you in quiet because you're moving from sort of a band of brothers to thousands of cousins ruling 10% of the world's oil reserves. Uh, and and uh, those who think that they're going to be on the out will make a play for power. We certainly see uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, becoming a more unpredictable uh, leader as he makes that play for power. Uh, we see that in defense, where he's unilaterally decided that Yemen is a good good area um, for a pro- for a proxy battle with Iran. We see that with respect to uh, to you know making making waves uh, in terms of floating the idea that they could sell off shares in Saudi Aramco. Um, you know we see that uh, we see that in um, in the way that uh, the the way that we hear discussions with the king go for business leaders, where he's basically waiting for cues from Mohammed bin Salman and his son. Um, so we highlight Saudi political instability as a risk um, more for the financial markets than for operations. Right, Saudi's going to be an okay place to do business, but instability in Saudi Arabia ripples through oil markets. Right, Saudi continues to pump, keeps the oil price down. Um, no, no real argument for, uh, for for Saudi changing its behavior anytime soon. Certainly not in an uncoordinated way. Um, and and coordination between Saudi and Iran seems further afield um, than than we could have highlighted before. Um, so we are all in an environment where we're kind of takers uh, in this Saudi political instability game. Not you know we're not saying. It, this is regime implosion. This is about a botch transition, figuring out who's up, who's down. Um, as a firm, we put out a theory 10 years ago called the J-curve, which basically looks at, at the opening process of, of countries. And, and to get from a stable autocratic regime to, an, to another stable autocratic regime or to an, uh, or to an open democratic regime, you, you go through, you kind of bottom out in the process uh, in terms of political stability. That's not an easy transition when you're starting at authoritarian regimes. So moving ahead, we've got about five more risks, and uh, I'll move through after this one. I'll move through the last three a bit faster. But number six, the rise of technologists. So what do we mean when we talk about the rise of technologists? Uh, The slide that's about to come up on your screen will drive home the fact that we've got some new political actors uh, on the scene. Uh, one of them is called Apple, whose uh, whose market value uh, adds up to pick your favorite 20 countries that you might do business in, but aren't huge economies. Apple's worth more than all of them. Um, we've got uh, new technologies that are decentralized, uh, but becoming widely available that present risks uh, and things we need to think about um, in the financial services industry. Um, we've got governments that don't know how to respond, and frankly, some of these technologists are creating real challenges for government response. So Xi Jinping flies to Washington, D.C. Obama gives him a scolding and says, stop hacking, stop hacking, stop doing cyber espionage, only, please only go after legitimate targets. They make an announcement on cybersecurity. Um, the U.S. feels like uh, they gave China uh, a stern talking to. China feels like they got some concessions uh, within the draft, within the communique that they put out. Then Xi Jinping flies to Silicon Valley and he's a rock star. Every CEO wants to meet him. So what is U.S. foreign policy when every CEO in Silicon Valley wants to meet with Xi Jinping, even though uh, the White House is basically saying, please stop trying to to hack our businesses and take our technology? You have a disrupted foreign policy in that sense because you've got political actors that are worth more to Xi Jinping as as businesses and businesses that see Xi Jinping as as, uh, more valuable to their strategy than cooperation with the U.S. government. That's one fundamental challenge. But I think the one... 
what is more front of mind uh, for the financial services community is digital innovation uh, with respect to the creation of uh, of blockchain, the creation of potential sovereign digital currencies. We've done a lot of work on this. I think we'll be doing uh, more work with the BBA on this going forward, but we put out a piece of thought leadership on blockchain I'd be happy to share in the way governments are going to respond. Um, It creates some severe challenges for governments, and it also, the the way that governments adopt this technology can create um, some real problems for the financial services industry going forward. So what happens if you see a move towards sovereign digital currencies? The PBOC said it's interested in a sovereign digital currency. Uh, What if you see a sovereign digital currency? What does that mean? Well, number one, um, it removes, uh, number one, it it removes uh, some of the financial disintermediation the financial services community provides. Number two, uh, it reduces uh, it reduces the ability of, uh, of entities to evade the government. So if you want to conduct business but not have the local government know everything about what you're doing, maybe that's appropriate in some cases, maybe it's not. Depending on where you're doing business, you'll no longer be able to because it'll be traceable. Um, it, it increases the ability of governments to impose currency controls, so you're a taker uh, in that. It, it changes the ability to monitor policy. So I think the Bank of England put out a paper talking about how uh, digital currencies would allow negative interest rates easier because you don't have a flight to cash. Uh, so it raises some really fundamental questions about the, the financial backdrop in which, in which we operate. Um, but it also creates opportunities for banks that are at the cutting edge of this technology. We hear a lot from our banking clients about wanting to understand uh, how, how these technologies can provide opportunities for them if they're at the forefront of it. Um, you know, private alternatives uh, to blockchain in the, in the Bitcoin sense. We think it's difficult to actually put forward, you know, fundamental private alternative, but uh, smart contracting that leverages Bitcoin technology. So when, you know, when you have a, when you have a contract, it can automatically, uh, it can automatically uh, trigger uh, when an event on that contract that the contract covers happens because it's, it's done through an open ledger system through Bitcoin. All of this is pretty interesting and there's the opportunity for firms to be at the cutting edge it requires a lot of investment. And frankly, from a risk management perspective, it requires uh, a lot of consideration about what parts of your business will not be viable five years from now um, as these technologies uh, become absorbed uh, and as governments wrestle with them. Um, I think you know you can play this out in second and third and fourth order situations where as the technologies, uh, as governments embrace some of these technologies or as financial services firm embrace this, it, cre- it creates uh, a political reaction that needs a secondary financial sector reaction that creates another political reaction. So we have to, we have to think more than one step ahead about how to take advantage of this and control risks. So moving ahead to number seven, unpredictable leaders. I've mentioned a couple of them already. But why is this a risk? You know, frankly, we see uh, a number uh, a number of leaders with a lot of power and the ability to do whatever they want against the weak backdrop, and they're doing it. So um, Putin can decide that he's going to try and resolve Syria. The geopolitics of Syria look a lot different than they did three weeks before. Um, the you know the Turkey can decide it doesn't want. Russia to resolve Syria, and suddenly they're playing in the same playground, shooting down planes. That's fundamentally problematic um, in a region that's already unstable. You've got a Ukrainian president um, who doesn't necessarily believe that that Crimea will always stay in Russian hands, maybe the only uh, one from a geographic perspective in Europe that doesn't want to acknowledge that, um, but is willing to continue to fight to try and reclaim it. Not a good backdrop, a constellation of unpredictable leaders creates greater international volatility. Does it mean um, that, that, that that bomb in the middle is actually going to explode? No, not necessarily. But it does mean you can wake up to headlines about the intersection of some of these leaders in geographies that are fundamental to our business on a regular basis uh, and have to decide whether something real is going on or not. So um, Turkey can go from uh, Turkey can go from having uh, decent relations with Russia and being uh, a great place for Russian tourists to go to suddenly being under effective sanction for Russian tourists because they shoot down a plane uh, and then have an ISIS attack in Sultanahmet in Turkey um, mean that German tourists aren't going to Turkey anymore. Uh, and suddenly the Turkish outlook looks different and it's not just because of unpredictable events. It's there because of geopolitical tension between Russia and Turkey providing headwinds on that government. Moving ahead to number eight, Brazil. 
Um, we can do entire conference calls for folks who really want to get in, in depth on Brazil. Um, but the key takeaway with Brazil as a top risk uh, for the financial sector is that doing business there is not going to get easier. We, uh, as a political risk firm, pride ourselves on being ahead of the curve uh, on political risk. Um, we did open a Sao Paulo office a couple of years ago, so um, some of, sometimes uh, you can have certain political items uh, arise on the agenda that can, uh, that, that can create second, third, and fourth, and fifth order um, conditions that lead you to a different place than you expected. That's what's happening in Brazil. Once you get a corruption scandal that picks up speed, the ability to understand where it ends and where government reclaims control uh, is pretty limited. So well, as a firm, we're committed to doing business in Brazil and believe that over the medium and long term, Brazil will, will be a great place to do business. The next year looks really bad. Um, so from a financial markets perspective, what are the likely outcomes? Well, uh, is Rousseff going to actually be removed from power? No, we don't think so. Uh, we'd put a 40% chance on that, but we just simply don't think that she'll be removed from power. Second question you have to ask, were she removed from power? So if we were wrong, is that a good thing? Markets would cheer it, right? The day that Rousseff is gone is the day that you see a big rally, uh, big rally in, in Brazilian assets. But will a successor government be able to implement some of the reforms Brazil needs? Absolutely not. Removal of uh, Rousseff creates a fundamentally toxic political environment that does not lead itself um, to resolution anytime soon. The only positive scenario we can give in Brazil, we put a 20% chance to this, is the Electoral Commission throwing out uh, Rousseff's re-election. If that happened, then you actually get an orderly political transition to a new government that can do something positive. But other than that, we're quite negative in the medium term, although over the long term, we see uh, Brazil in good shape. Now, that, that, uh, that, that short and medium term includes, uh, includes upcoming sporting events. It includes the Zika virus. Brazil's not got a good situation going on right now. It doesn't mean stop doing business there. It just means be aware of the risks. We're committed to continuing to do business there. You've just got to understand the environment that your clients are operating in or that you're operating in and that it's not going to get better in, uh, in the short term. So number nine, not enough elections. Um, this is not about our preference for democracy. I gave this, uh, I gave this presentation in a country that doesn't have elections, um, and I got some quizzical looks. This is not about advocating uh, for democracy. It's about the fact that elections provide escape valves uh, in emerging markets for middle classes with rising expectations and demands on their governments, and that when you have an absence of elections, you generally have an absence of government turnover. So Rousseff can have 0% approval, but there's no election on the horizon. She's not going anywhere unless some Someone can remove her from power. Uh, not a healthy slate of elections on the agenda uh, at this time, uh, and many of them have already, you know, have occurred. Taiwan, you've already had. Uh, you've had a transition. Did that transition provide us a better political situation or not? Um, well, from an economic perspective, the new Taiwanese government is fundamentally committed to economic reform, making Taiwan uh, more like the Taiwan of the 80s, which was really powerful and innovative. Uh, but it's also the pro-independence party. Now, Taiwan's not a top risk, but it's something to monitor, right? When you get elected as the president of the pro-independence party, you can say all of the right things, but at some point, the pro-independence party may expect you to be pro-independent. Um, and that, that can potentially be problematic. No, no additional escape valve there. Um, but it's more, uh, it's more a number of, a number of countries, um, that we had, where we had elections in 2014, 2015, be it Turkey, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, um, where governments are struggling or picking up traction slowly and the threat of a new election, uh, can focus the mind. A lot of these governments actually have plenty of time. Um, so that brings me to my final risk, uh, with respect to Turkey. Where, um, where you can look at Turkey a couple of ways, um, only one of which is positive. I mean, on the one hand, um, the return of the AKP uh, majority uh, provides political stability in a traditional sense, right? You know who the government is. You know who the decision makers are. It's predictable in that sense. Uh, the challenge is you've got an unpredictable leader uh, in Turkey, and you've got one that's focused on creating a presidential, uh, a presidential alternative to the country's parliamentary system. So Erdogan's in campaigning mode. Um, he he wants to get a he he wants that majority in parliament. He wants the ability to create this presidential uh, environment. So he's doing he, he's playing to populist tendencies. He's not focused on um, continuing the trend of Turkey as sort of an emerging market darling that that uh, that attracts tons of inbound investment. Doesn't mean they're agnostic to investment. Plenty of firms are still doing deals. Uh, we're we're doing a lot of business uh, in Turkey now. It's it's a, a fine place to do business. So this is not about. Uh, 
Uh, this is not about saying um, that, that everyone should rethink their Turkey strategy. We're all, all quite invested. Uh, but it's about being aware of the risks and about a government that is, uh, that is more focused on populism than on reform, that's playing a, a difficult geopolitical ballgame in a really tough neighborhood. I mean, uh, the, Turkey is a taker on a lot of these things, even if they can, even if they can provide uh, security and peace. You know, the refugee crisis starts there. ISIS can strike there, and the government is uh, the, go the government is uh, is being quite proactive uh, in trying to combat and, and shape realities on the ground uh, in Syria, and that just increases the risk. So I'll click through a couple of red herrings real fast, and then I'll be pleased to have some discussion and some questions here. Um, the U.S. election, uh, so you see Donald Trump on this slide. Uh, is the U.S. election a top risk for us? We would argue that it is not a top risk. Certainly, uh, certainly it, it, it's looking increasingly likely that uh, Donald Trump could get the Republican nomination. I'd be happy to walk you through all this. My background as our U.S. political uh, lead for a number of years, so I'm perfectly happy to walk through all the details on that. I think Hillary Clinton has a slight edge in this election, um, but a slight edge isn't a reason that you call the U.S. election a red herring. You call it a red herring because the system that the next president you know, be it Donald Trump, uh, be it Hillary Clinton, be it Marco Rubio, or be it Paul Ryan, who we have on the slide, who's not even running. But if you get to the convention in July at the Republican Party and no leader has gotten a majority of delegates, he could be nominated on the floor of the convention and run the system that they're operating in will constrain them. Uh, Donald Trump is running a one-man campaign right now. Uh, it's hard to point to who his Treasury Secretary would be because it seems like it would be him. You, know, you can point to some. You can point to some regimes where you know the president is also the Energy Secretary. Donald Trump can be everything through to Veterans Affairs. He can be everything um, in the U.S. government. But the reality is he'll be sitting atop uh, a government um, with a set of rules and regulations, a Congress populated likely by the Republican Party that has slightly different preferences than Trump. And by the time that Trump would be elected, he will have had to move to the center uh, and, and uh, gotten, gotten backing from the Republican establishment. I just don't, I don't see the risk from an economic perspective. I think no matter who is elected uh, in 2016, you're going to have a mildly expansionary fiscal policy in the U.S. If it's a Republican, it'll be because of tax reform and tax cuts. If it's a Democrat, it'll be from a spending side. Um, but I do think you'd get a fundamentally different tone. Um, Donald Trump takes us back uh, to the time where, you know, I, I, as an American living in Europe during the George W. Bush years, you'd hear a lot of Europeans saying it's not what he's doing, it's the way he's saying it. We'll take that, multiply it by 10. That's a Donald Trump presidency, but the fundamental point is it's not what he's doing, right? Um, Donald Trump is not going to unilaterally cut off trade ties with China, regardless of what he says about that. That will not happen. But will he label China a currency manipulator and say some pretty nasty things? Yeah, absolutely, you bet. And will that lead to a reaction? Absolutely. Um, do we think China is headed for a hard landing? No. Um, its politics are going to remain stable. Certainly, um, certainly we're not you know, massive China bulls. We think the currency will decline by 5 to 8% this year. Uh, it's not a great situation there. Uh, but our Asia practice head, Evan Medeiros, was Obama's lead for all of Asia until a few months ago, meaning he personally negotiated with Xi Jinping and every Asian leader from his perspective. She knows what's going on. This is a tough transition uh, with uh, uh, sitting atop one of the world's largest economies in transition. Uh, the anti-corruption campaign uh, is setting China up. Uh, for a fundamentally more stable economic environment a few years from now. That's a tough transition if you're doing business in China. Uh, are your partners going to get swept up in it? You bet it's a possibility. Uh, it's pretty hard to predict. Um, but the SOE reform process, she's doing all of the right things um, to, to set China up fine for the medium term. And whether, the gro you know, whether Chinese growth is going to be 5% or 6.4% or what, it, what is it really, fundamentally important to asset prices and to market volatility. But, we, but, but underlying all of that, we don't have a reason to believe um, that, that, uh, that the system is at stake. And that's why we, leave, why, why we list it to be a red herring. That's the same with respect to geopolitical tensions in each, East Asia. Um, we know that the North Korea likes to saber rattle amid the U.S. election cycle because it's trying to get U.S. presidential candidates to take a stake in the Korean issue. So that's why you're starting to see uh, Kim Jong-un back on the scene after, after a bit of quiet. Um, you're also seeing China build landing strips on disputed islands and things like that. We just don't see it boil over into anything hot. Um, this year. Um, 
And, and I already addressed this final bullet point about a hard landing in China. Um, so with that, uh, with that, uh, I'm happy to entertain some questions. Thanks very much, from, uh, Sean. One, one from me first. Um, you've lifted our eyes to the horizon as, as good risk managers. We need to do that from time to time rather than getting stuck in the weeds of what uh, the revised standardized approach to credit risk might mean for our lending to acquisition, development, and construction uh, property uh, deals over the next uh, two years. But of course, banks have their um, the basis in trade, or at least historically they did guarantees, letters of credit, discounting trade bills, foreign exchange. What do you, what do you think the, uh, the, the sort of uh, the closing down of, uh, of countries, the nationalization of countries is going to do uh, to trade and, and finance? You know, we, we live in a, a globally connected market. That trade's going to continue? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Are we headed for protectionism of mass destruction? Or some, some, something you can think of, you know, Smoot-Hawley tariffs and beggar thy neighbor trade policies and things like that? No, absolutely not. In fact, uh, one of the most optimistic stories I can give you is about, well, Europe is sort of struggling with nationalism and trying to decide what constitutes Europe. You've got an Asia that's rapidly integrating um, and that, that's rapidly, uh, rapidly liberalizing trade. So I think it's important to draw a distinction. One of the biggest opportunities um, uh, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal, um, which will be ratified, will be implemented, and will lead to massive growth um, for Vietnam and for Malaysia, but also for businesses that want to realign their supply chain with respect to the NAFTA region, which is a part of it, uh, to Latin America, a couple of countries, Mexico and Peru and Chile are part of the deal, um, as well as for additional Asian countries uh, that, that are looking likely to join the deal in a second wave, South Korea and potentially Indonesia. So you've got, uh, on the one hand, you've got, you, you, you've got a lot of the factors you've described, which I think do present risks, um, at least transaction costs, right? I talked about uh, a, a fraying of the Schengen regime being an in, implicit tax on trade. I think that's, I think that's right. Uh, Two-year negotiation about a UK exit uh, from the EU and, and a, a putting in place of a different type of access to the European market for the UK uh, would, would certainly be disruptive. Um, do, I, do I think we're headed into the reverse of globalization? Do I believe, you know, like I said, that, that, that leaders like Donald Trump or others who really just want to look out, uh, look out for their own or say they do are doing anything more than pandering to the crowd? Not necessarily, no. Uh, I'm actually pretty optimistic about global trade and about global finance, but I think, uh, I think we have to temper uh, some of that enthusiasm and realize that governments are more willing to use weapons uh, that they weren't willing to use before. So we put out a phrase um, uh, last year, risk number four was the weaponization of finance. So you've got governments that are willing to bring finance into the crosshairs for geopolitical purposes. I think you're going to see more of that because you don't get the same political reaction that you used to when you do, right? So when the U.S. Committee on Foreign Investment rejects a deal um, from a Chinese firm in the U.S. Uh, and asserts its control over the mergers and acquisitions process, you used to get a parade of CEOs saying, please don't screw up the relationship with China. We're doing tons of business. You don't get that anymore. Um, when, uh, when the U.S. or the EU threatens to cut off uh, access to its currency for clearing, or threatens to cut off uh, or threatens to put in place sanctions um, for, with kind of a hair trigger, willingness to use sanctions much higher than it's been in recent years, you don't get the same you don't get the same pushback. You get a lot of a, a lot of firms trying to figure out how to navigate that, rather than rushing immediately. The political leader saying, "Don't use the weapons you have for nationalist or for foreign policy purposes." So I think that presents some risk, but it's a lot more esoteric um, than a decline in trade. Sure, you mentioned the uh, the Brexit word there. Uh, we've had less than a, a week to digest what those eight or nine pages uh, mean in real life. And I should say that the BBA doesn't have a, a view on Brexit. We're polling our members using an independent polling company right now to see what they think we should be saying about Brexit, if anything. Do you have a view yet as to the impact of Brexit on the financial markets in, in the UK? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, we as a firm uh, certainly believe it will be disruptive. It's easy, it's easy to get pulled into kind of narratives 
that that say at the end of the day, London is so attractive um, that it will continue. It, it will continue to present uh, a real real opportunity for uh, for firms. It's got this knowledge capital that's not going anywhere. It's got yeah, it's got financial architecture that's not going anywhere. And by the way, everyone already tried to move to Switzerland and didn't really like it. Um, so now they've come back, right? You've got you've got plenty of reasons you can point to for why we're not going to have uh, some of the more negative scenarios with respect to Brexit. But the reality is, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, the EU is going to make it harder for Britain to be a euro clearing hub, right? I mean, if you're doing business in euros, the, you, the, the EU is going to have a much different set of incentives uh, in the future than it did, uh, than it does today for allowing Britain to be kind of that hub. They're going to be competing financial sectors. National, uh, national governments are going to say, you know, why is all that business going to London? We should be, uh, we, we should be making a plan supporting our industry here. And I frankly, I just think that renegotiation and, and disruptive period, the two-year period uh, where Britain negotiates its exit, uh, where we find out whether Scotland stays or goes, which could pr- provide a, uh, or sc- could provide a second order, and then whether other countries Trees leave the EU on the back of it. I mean, all of this needs to be mapped out from a scenarios perspective by firms so they understand not just how it impacts their business directly, but how it impacts their customers. Because I think, I think this is going to present some, some real changes for the way that firms do business. We're working with a lot of multinational corporations that will change their procurement processes that may change their headquarters as a result of this. I think it's pretty problematic. Um, and, and I wouldn't, you know, it's not to, it, it's not to, to, present a hyper negative point of view um, and say that, you know, because we don't have a preference about, uh, about whether Britain should stay or go either, but it, I would not get pulled into uh, conversations. I would, not, I would not buy narratives that it won't be disruptive, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, no thanks for that. Um, we haven't really talked about aging populations, and I think that's something that uh, we all, as we age, uh, are uh, quite uh, aware of. And of course, China has an aging population. It's not just uh, the West that has an aging population. Does that does that mean anything? Do you think uh, going forward? Certainly, certainly an interesting question. It has a couple of ramifications. I mean, number one, countries that are that are more willing uh, and more open to immigration will wind up weathering the demographic storm a lot better. The problem is that the current political environment makes countries that even countries that were open to immigration reconsider their policies, which will um, which will increase the potential for labor shortages in the future. At the same time, uh, you've got you've already got difficult fiscal situations for a lot of different countries um, that just becomes harder uh, due to demographics. If you think about the U.S., right, Barack Obama brought the U.S. from a 10 percent deficit relative to GDP to a sub 3 percent, a sustainable rate, theoretically, um, of GDP. But if you look at if you look at the curves for where U.S. deficits as a percent of GDP go in 2019, 2020, all the way through. The U.S. is lucky if it's Japan um, by the end of that, and it, you know you could play out. So you, you could you could say that that if the U.S. does nothing to resolve those types of demands on its social system uh, by changing either its tax situation or reducing the benefits, the U.S. could become a Greece, right? I mean, yeah, I'm not. I, I don't mean to be super provocative, but the charts don't look that different, right? If you go out to 2030. Uh, left unaddressed, a demogra- demographic situation in the U.S. leads to a debt crisis in the U.S. We know that. Um, do the political leaders have a better uh, chance now of addressing that or a worse chance? I would argue they have a worse chance. It's a lot harder uh, in a down cycle or fragile economic environment to make tough political changes. Um, and that's the same with respect to immigration. I mean, if you look at Japan, uh, if you look at Japan um, as an example, if Japan had decided uh, instead of taking a kind of a cultural approach that it wanted to be open to massive influx of permanent immigration, it might not have lost decades. It might have had a different situation. So that's an experiment you can look at. It decided not to, and maybe uh, maybe zero growth when you're you know from a relative baseline is an okay situation for some governments going forward. But it's certainly not um, the type of thing that financial firms are hoping for, or looking for uh, when they when they want uh, when they want to increase trade, when they want to increase business, when they want to increase. Uh, finance. So I think uh, I think it's tough challenges. Some governments are better positioned to deal with it than others. Um, but I'd say the environment has made it much harder to resolve. Sean, I, w- I want to raise the question that um, we did a webinar on Iran and sanctions just a couple of weeks ago, um, and very popular that that it was. And um, what's the viewpoint, geopolitical viewpoint, on Iran and relations with Iran? Um, U.S. vis-a-vis um, Europe as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, certainly there are plenty of uh, certainly there are plenty of firms that are now able to go into Iran that are rushing in to do business. Um, 
and frankly, you know, frankly, there are, there are reasons why firms would want to do that. Um, but I, I would highlight a couple of key considerations uh, with respect to that. Number one, um, I think I think Iran will remain a, a kind of um, U.S. U.S. political pinata, right? If you've got a situation where your best case scenario with respect um, to softening U.S.-Iran relations is Hillary Clinton becoming president, right, because the Republican side is going to be a whole lot harsher on Iran, um, and Hillary has to take a more hawkish point of view on the Iran deal. Um, I don't, you know, I don't really see a normalization of trade relations between the U.S. and Iran, which means I don't see the ability of firms uh, that have a substantial U.S. presence to feel comfortable banking people doing business um, in Iran without without having a pit in their stomach about the risks, uh, the, the risks of, of Iran falling a foul of some of the commitments that it made in the U.S. snapping back sanctions. And number two, you know, rushing into Iran, um, people forget it's, it's not exactly an easy place to do business. So, you know, we see this. We saw a huge rush into Myanmar by firms as soon as, uh, as soon as firms were able to get in Myanmar and a world starved for growth. You look at, you look at countries that have potentially, potentially high growth or big populations and you can tend to set aside the fact that they may not be great places to do business. Um, uh, you know, Ar- Iran is not, not necessarily um, the, mo- the, the easiest place to do business, and firms should consider that um, quite substantially, not just look at the population size and potential economic growth, but really whether they understand how to navigate it. Um, as a U.S. firm, we can't advise anyone who's looking to do a transaction um, in Iran, and we have no, no intention to do that. Um, but, I, but, but to me, just looking at a macro level, um, it, seems like it, it seems like there are so many questions around doing business there. Um, and I can't give you a real good political situation beyond the facts on the ground, right? The fact that there has been a deal and that now some firms can. I can't really give you a good geopolitical uh, reason why one would believe that it'll get easier or better to do business beyond what we already have. Like you can pocket the deal that you have, um, especially with Iran Saudi tension heating up. And that's, you know, that, that is a, a fundamental point of analysis here. Um, that we have to think about that that you've got a you've got a government that really does believe it is vying for leadership of the region, um, and if that's the case, that can lead to some pretty negative outcomes and can force businesses to choose sides too. Um, if this uh, if this plays out uh, in a in a, neg- a more negative scenario, and the and the the, the low oil price is obviously impacting hugely um, on, on on the global economy. Um, do you, do you see that? Um, continuing. Yeah, uh, we believe that, you know, at best you're going to see $40 oil at the end of the year, $50 next year, and an equilibrium sometime in somewhere in the $60 range a year after that. Um, we're seeing U.S. production uh, be pretty resilient. We're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing things like like vague commitments to freeze, which means governments are going to continue to flood the market currently, right? What does freeze mean? Freeze means we're going to do what we've been doing. What we've been doing is already priced in. That's not exactly uh, not exactly a commitment to raise prices back up. That creates huge fragility in a number of markets. I mean, people looking at Venezuela, there are, there, there are a number of governments who can deal with this. Russia can weather the storm. Saudi can weather the storm. A number of Gulf countries that have started to diversify their economy can weather the storm, um, but can they weather it for five or ten years? Um, does it force them into tough choices? Uh, and do we see any, any sign of like a real rapid recovery back to the 80 or 90 or $100 uh, prices that, that allow some of these governments' budgets to balance? No, not in the near term. Uh, and that, that really that, that creates some significant um, fragility in the system, and we're already seeing customers already pocketed a decline in prices. You know, we're we're not seeing it all get. We've seen it all get passed through, um, and uh, so there's not. It's hard to tell you a positive story about that. So we've just got a couple of questions before we end um, our time together. Uh, um, Simon, I'm sure you've got that on screen. Sure. So, um, so there were, there is a question here about uh, the GCC countries in general with the associated uh, associated risks in 2016. You know, I just spent uh, just spent a week in. in a number of GCC countries. You know, the the perspective I came away I came away with, uh, and our analysts who cover the GCC, the perspective that they have is that actually governments are most governments are well positioned to weather the current environment. They've started to diversify the economy. They've put in place the reforms on the front end uh, to take the pain. They've got um, you know there are a number of countries, be it UAE or be it 
cuts are actually have uh, financial platforms and financial sectors um, that provide some diversification um, away from away from just energy prices. We're not concerned about political instability outside of the Saudi risks that I highlighted. That's not that's not a concern for us um, with respect to the GCC at this point. Um, although I think you could probably have some interesting conversations about Bahrain um, over the medium term. And another question there, uh, Sean, about uh, the impact of uh, Ira- Iranian oil production as that uh, comes on stream. Is that going to be a game changer? I think it, I, I think it's you know a fundamental building block for why Saudi is uh, flooding the market right now. Right from a Saudi point of view, do you let Iran come on at a cheap price, or do you let Iran come on at a good price for Iran? Um, you let them come on at a cheap price, so Iran gets access to its reserves. It can make some money from selling oil, 400 to 500 thousand barrels per day by the end of this year. That's real. Those are real numbers. Um, but they're doing it in a low oil price environment, so it's not as beneficial for them. Uh, so I do think I do think that's a fundamental reason why we have uh, why, why we have a commitment from the Saudi regime to continue doing what they're doing. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Simon, and also thank you, Sean, for for your time. If you do have any questions, um, um, we'll provide Sean's details afterwards. If you don't mind, Sean, um, um, answering any questions that um, our members um, will will have on this subject. Uh, may I remind you that in the resource tab below the screen um, in front of you is an opportunity to access Eurasia's full report on the risks of 2016. It makes for interesting and, and very good uh, bedtime as well as daytime reading is, 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 is well on, on that. Um, thank you very much indeed and um, yeah, we, we would love to do more opportunities like this together.